Star Wars only, I don't know what the fuck your problem is. Hello there Star Wars fans, I'm Star Wars only and today we're doing our Let's Talk Star Wars podcast. I answer your questions you guys ask me on my community tab and my Instagram. I also did some uh, questions on my Instagram as well that I have. So it'll be a nice little lengthy video but it should be fun so let's get into the very first question from Wolvie. It is, what about the droid attack on the Wookiees? And that's a very good question, and he's got a point there. It's a system we can't afford to lose. The Mad Commenter asks, Have you ever seen Spaceballs? If so, what are your thoughts about it? I've never seen Spaceballs, sadly. And I know it came out, I think, in 87. So it was after the original trilogy. And it's just never something that's interested me. And it's not saying that it's bad. I've seen clips of it. But it, for me, it's just something that I'm like, oh, it looks kind of funny, but eh, like I don't really care to see it. Eventually, I will see it, just for the hell of it. I know it's a big Star Wars thing, so I probably should see it. And I'm pretty sure it's good. I've heard a lot of great things about it, but no, I've never seen it, sadly. But it is something I need to work on and get to watching eventually. Elemental Jedi asks four questions here. He says, if Lucasfilm made a Lego Star Wars movie similar to Lego movies, do you think it's a good idea? Is the first question he asked. Is it a good idea? No. The reason, the reason it's not a good idea is because... All of this can be summed up into one thing is that they already have Lego Star Wars like shows, I believe, on Disney XD and everything. I remember watching Rebels when that came out. Before it, like the little the the show before it would normally be the little Star Wars Lego thing, and I would always, you know, flip to the Rebel show before it started about five minutes, just you know, get ahead of it, I guess, and get to the channel. It would show that last five minutes of the Star Wars Lego stuff, and it seemed very corny, very childish. Stuff that's meant for kids. I mean, it is on Disney XD. So that's not something I think is a good idea. The Lego movie was unique the first time around simply because it was a Lego movie. It wasn't about Star Wars. It wasn't about Marvel. It wasn't about DC. Because then that could be potential movies as well. I mean, they just did one with the Batman guy. Um, or the Batman Lego Batman a few years ago, right? It was a year or two ago. I watched it. I really didn't think it was that good of a film. But the Lego movie itself was really good. But that's because it was unique in of itself. So I don't think a Lego Star Wars movie is that good of an idea. The Lego Star Wars video games, the first few that had no voices or anything like that, those were classics and greats. Uh, Elemental Jedi asked the second question. He said, is it something I'd watch? And that's a no. I probably wouldn't watch it. And then he asks, if the story is new, should it be canon to the Star Wars universe or the Lego movie universe? If they ever make something like that, I, I definitely think they should keep it to the Lego movie universe. But don't forget, they already have like a Lego Star Wars universe because they have that Lego show, Lego Star Wars show and everything. So I definitely don't think we're ever going to get a Lego Star Wars movie like in theaters. One day they might put something on Disney streaming service, the Disney Plus. But other than that, I really can't think of anything. This next question is from Patrick McDuff. He asks, which Star Wars character is most underrated in your opinion? Also, congrats on 25K. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, the most underrated Star Wars character, I, I always talk about this, and it's something that I feel like I, I change my answer on a lot because there are a lot of underrated characters. One of them that I I've recently been thinking about, honestly, was uh, Jar Jar, and it sucks to say it, not like as in he's a good character, but I think a lot of people kind of forget just how important he was in the prequels, which is annoying for people like me who don't like the character of Jar Jar. It's it's one of those things where you have to reconcile with the fact that not only is he a main character in the prequels, it's the fact that he is an integral part of the story in the prequels. And for me, that makes him, in a way, underrated because of what he does. You know, in episode one, he's this goofball idiot, because, I mean, that's what he is. His character is just stupid. And then he becomes the, the army general, which was mind-boggling dumb on Boston's boss and Ass's part. And then in the second movie, he gives emergency powers to Palpatine. And then in the third movie, he's there when Padme's dead, and you can see him all sad and everything, and it's like, wow, this guy may be responsible for the entire galaxy being destroyed. It, it was in that new Empire's End book or whatever, the Aftermath trilogy that came out, and, and they talked about that, about Jar Jar being shamed on Naboo and everything. I think he's underrated in that sense. Other characters that are underrated, I mean, there's, there's a lot, honestly. And if we're going expanded universe... There's countless. Uh, C-3PO could be considered underrated. A lot of people don't like him. Well, not don't like him, but they pick R2-D2 over him. Like Everyone likes R2 more than they like C-3PO. This next question comes from Peter Lobry. He says, We know there will be 12 Clone Wars episodes, brand new Clone Wars episodes, but nobody ever specified how many arcs. Do you think it should be 12 different stories, but each episode will be an hour long? Similar to Netflix shows, I really enjoy your channel. Here's to another 25,000. Thank you, Peter. I definitely don't think they're going to do 12 episodes with 12 different stories and 12 different arcs. 
I think more or less you're going to have six arcs in total, maybe five or four, you know, maybe they'll do, you know, three episodes for each arc or something like that, or four episodes for each arc. You never know. I, I definitely think that they're going to do the two episode for each arc, though. That's what they did in the past. So that might be one of them, but you could have one of them, one arc have four and then, you know, one have three and then two of them have two arcs or something like that. I mean, there's a lot of variables that go into that. that I mean, I really can't think of all of them, but look at the past i definitely think it's a two episode for an art kind of show and i think they're going to stick to that and remember these arcs have already been made uh, many years ago these are they're going off the plans they had for the original star wars season seven of the clone Wars series so i don't think it's going to be drastically different from that so i think the arcs are kind of already set in place and i definitely don't think it's going to be something crazy like 12 different arcs so no i don't think that's going to happen but i am excited for it i definitely do want to see what the stories are that they go into besides the one that they showed us i definitely think there's more stories behind that than what we've seen and i really want to see what other stories they have in store for us and hopefully they show a little bit more of that uh this april in star wars celebration we have another question from the guy the mad commenter have you ever ridden star tours if so what are your thoughts on it Star Tours, if you don't know, is a ride in Disney World and Disneyland, I believe. I don't know if it was in Disneyland. I've never been to Disneyland, but I have been to Disney World, and it did have Star Tours. And yes, I've ridden that ride countless times. I've been to Disney World maybe six times in my life and uh, as like a vacation and just you know go for maybe four days or a week. And it, it's always been really nice, and I, I've liked Star Tours a lot. I remember one time when me and my mom went, it was... Geez, Star Tours was still a big thing. This was, I think this maybe back in 2014, I don't know. It was definitely after Disney had bought Star Wars and was getting ready to make Episode 7, but it was before Episode 7 came out. And there was one day, because Star Tours is at Hollywood Studios in Disney World, there was like no lines for it. And if you don't, if you've never ridden the ride, it's a story, but it's a story driven ride where you kind of go on a Star Wars adventure. But you can change out different parts of the scenes. You know, you everyone every time you go on, it's a different adventure. There's different characters you're meeting and everything, and different planets you're visiting. It's actually very unique, and it was a very good good ride. I've always enjoyed it. So there was one day where we spent maybe an hour or two just going back and forth on it because there was nobody in line. So yes, I, I've ridden it. I, I enjoy it a lot. I I've loved it. I definitely think I definitely recommend going if you've never gone. If you've never ridden the ride, uh, Star Tours. It's very enjoyable, honestly. I love it. Every every minute of it was always really fun. I remember one time there's a video of Mark Hamill actually meeting fans there, like just surprising them and like, hey, I'm here and everything. So I think that's very cool, and I definitely think there's a lot of joy to be had with them. And even the lines itself. I mean, you get to walk underneath an ad at. There's also C-3PO and R2-D2, you know, talking and everything. It looks very realistically Star Wars, and it. I mean, it's honestly really cool. If you've never been, I definitely recommend going. This next question comes from Darling and the Devil Luke, I believe is how you say it. I don't know. Uh, do you feel Episode Nine will save the sequel trilogy? Well, what's it saving it from is the question. Because you have two different sides on the on the sequel trilogy right now. You have the people who don't like them, who are you know boycotting Episode Nine already going in, and for them it's like, well, you can't save the film for them. If they're not going to see it, then there's nothing to save for them at that point. I mean, come on, like they're already giving up. Then you have the people who already like episode 9 before it's even come out because they're just you know fans of star wars you have those star wars fans who are set in stone i'm going to like this before it even comes out because i'm a star wars fan you you have these two different sides and both are very set on what their opinions are for episode 9 already and that sucks so the question is what is going to be saved with episode 9 for me i've always said and i still think episode 9 will be the best one out of the sequel trilogy and it will definitely make the sequel trilogy be an interesting talk in terms of what it offers as a trilogy because if you look at the stories we have with episode 7 and episode 8 it's nothing too new or intriguing in my opinion episode 7 was definitely a nostalgia fest of we're going to rely a lot on the original trilogy but we're going to go to different parts of the star wars universe and start up with these new characters but this is mainly a stepping stone kind of film to get you interested in what happens next. And it did that. That's ex I mean, if you said you weren't interested in Episode 8 after Episode 7, yeah, I think you're lying, honestly. Because I, I remember walking out of that film being like, you know, that was an okay film, but I'm definitely interested in seeing what happens with Luke. That's what everybody was wondering. What's going to happen with Luke? That, that's basically the whole build-up to the movie. And then you get to Episode 8, and for me, it was a big miss. And it was definitely a film that divided the fan base. So now with Episode 9, it's like, well... Is it really going to unite the entire fandom? 
that's the big goal, and I guess that would be what is saving the trilogy, and that's a really hard thing to do, honestly. It really is, because you even go back to the, the prequels, you, you already had, within episode one, after episode one, you already had people who were like, dang, Star Wars sucks now, because they didn't like The Phantom Menace. And a lot of people with episode two didn't like it either. Episode three was definitely one that everyone liked, and that one did better than episode two in terms of sales. So could that happen with episode nine? That My prediction is yes, that's what I've been saying, but this is a very different film. There's a few things I think episode nine has to do to actually save the sequel trilogy, if you will. The first thing is to break even in terms of finances. You actually have to make a film that's profitable and something that can prove that the franchise is still viable for the future and we can still put out films. If it doesn't break even, then yeah, the the sequel trilogy really was a big miss and something that will be kind of tragic to even talk about, honestly. And then you also have the uh, next thing that I think they need to do is unite the fandom in, in order to save the sequel trilogy. And also, the last one, for me, which is more important than the second one, is actually just have a good film. Something that's better than Episode Seven, Something that's better than Episode Eight. A great film. Do something very interesting. Do something that actually revolutionizes the film industry. Be bold. Go out and do something that's never been done before. The last thing I think Episode Nine needs to do, which for me is very important, I think is more important than maybe even the second point or the first point that I had, which is go out and do something different, bold, and good. You know, like make a good film that is different from all the other Star Wars films we've had. You know, you don't have to be so different like The Last Jedi, but you also don't have to be so familiar like The Force Awakens. It's very weird to say. I know Star Wars fans kind of get made fun of for this, where it's like, they always say, oh, this is too much like the original trilogy, but then this next film's too different from the original trilogy. You have to find a middle ground, of course, but you also have to keep the narrative of Star Wars, the good versus evil, while creating your own different story. It's It sounds complicated, I know, but, I mean, they had a good start with Episode Seven. And I think because J.J. Abrams may have more control with Episode Nine, I think it may be a better film. But I don't know. Right now, I'm I'm a little concerned right now for a few reasons, and I'll explain them maybe one day later uh, if I need to, and if it if it's something that I'm still going to be concerned with. But there are a few indications that are concerning me already. Uh, But overall, I'm still really excited for Episode Nine, and I don't think it'll save the sequel trilogy because I don't think there's uh, I, I don't think there's really much to talk about on what's being saved in my opinion. Uh, this next question is by T Moose 313 He says, if you were to choose any sort of Star Wars merchandise to release, what would you choose to do and why? I, I, well, that's a tough one. I, I'm not sure. Maybe the action figures are kind of cool. I'd probably maybe pick the lightsabers, honestly. I remember being a big saber fan, and I've never wanted to build them per se, but working with those would be very interesting for me. Um, in general, I, I obviously with Instagram, I'm I'm interested in kind of marketing in a way and the memes and whatnot and YouTube. It's you know video editing and stuff like that and talking Star Wars. So there's a lot of different things that I'd be interested if I could work with Star Wars, you know, in, in like a professional business way. Uh, but definitely making lightsabers probably would be my like first choice and easiest one to go for because it's something I'm already familiar with and already have liked in the past. The Mad Commenter asks another question. How do you think R2-D2 felt about Anakin's turn to the dark side? Do you think he was sad? That's something that I've always been kind of annoyed with not entirely knowing. I mean, R2-D2 has... He knows almost everything about Star Wars. I mean, he he knows the story of Anakin Skywalker. He knew him when he was a nine-year-old boy. He saw him turn to the dark side. He saw him, you know, choke Padme to death, I believe. I mean, he was there for all of it. C-3PO's mind got wiped, but R2's didn't. Why did he never say anything to anybody? I mean, he knew everything. And even in episodes 7, 8, I mean, you look at episode 7, he's like out of commission for the longest time, but, you know, BB-8 gets back and he's like, oh, I guess I'll come back now and help out or something. I mean, come on. like he's, I don't know. It, R2 is a definitely unique droid. There's some plot holes with him. And the fact that he knows everything but hasn't told anybody is so weird. And I don't know if he would really be sad about Anakin's turn to the dark side. I mean, he just seemed to be... He, he didn't he didn't seem to phase him. I mean, I guess he's just... I guess he didn't give a fuck. I mean, good for him. But, yeah, I mean, I guess he's cold-hearted. Because, I mean, he just kind of kept rolling, honestly. So, I, I definitely don't think he was sad. Uh, Elemental Jedi asked two questions. What's better in terms of popularity? Star Wars or DC? 
Elemental Jedi asks a question, what's better in terms of popularity, Star Wars or DC? I definitely would have to say Star Wars, man. I mean, even even though some people don't like the way Star Wars has gone, look at those DC movies. C come on. I mean, don't get me wrong. The Batman movies from Christopher Nolan, the Dark Knight trilogy, some of the greatest films ever, especially in terms of superhero films, I don't think you're going to beat the Dark Knight. That, that film itself is probably one of my top ten maybe, maybe, I'm not entirely sure, maybe top five film of all time. I mean, that is a masterpiece of a film. I love that film. And so something like that is definitely hard for a lot of Star Wars films to compete with. I do think there are some films that are better that, than that film. I do think Star Wars can offer some films that are actually better than The Dark Knight. But overall, DC has put out some pretty bad films recently. The Justice League movie, I fell asleep during that. You know how hard it is for me to fall asleep during a movie? I fell asleep during that movie, the Justice League movie. That was that was an awful film. I fell asleep for a good 20 minutes, I believe. That's what my friend told me. I, I stayed awake for most of it, but that was just awful. Believe it or not, that Wonder Woman was actually really good. That was an actually good movie. I enjoyed that one more than any of them. Uh, the Man of Steel ones, that, that was okay. Didn't he have, like, a first one... And then the second one was him versus Batman. Yeah, Dawn of Justice, that was that was awful too. That, I was I was concerned with that movie. The second Bruce Wayne started flying in that cave, when the bat started taking him up like he was Jesus or something, I was like, what the fuck, dude? No, I can't do this. Or I was already turned off by that. And then Cyborg, you see how Cyborg looks? He looks awful. And what was up with that god awful upper lip in in the new Justice League? Uh, I don't know. I, I, Shazam looks good. I heard Aquaman was good. I haven't seen it. But honestly, I would pick Rogue One over most DC films. And I would definitely pick the original trilogy and, and, and Revenge of the Sith even over a lot of the DC films as well. So, yeah, no. The next question from Elemental Jedi is actually a really funny one. What would you do if you had a son or daughter that likes Star Wars as much as you do? but thinks the prequels are better than the originals. Ah, see. I wouldn't have a son or daughter that would think that. <laughs> that's that's the misconception here, buddy. No, I, I honestly would have to have some serious debates with my kids if that... I mean, why, why would they think the prequels would be better, though? They're not, they wouldn't be growing up with the prequels. I mean, I'm the one who grew up with the prequels. The Phantom Menace is a day younger than me. I was born on the 18th. So, yeah, I was, I was born a day before the Phantom Menace. Yeah, I, I'm the one who grew up with the prequels. Why would they be wanting to love the prequels over the originals? I, that would be a big concern, in my in my opinion. Because I, I definitely would argue, you know, what what part of the prequels do you think is better than the originals of, you know, you can argue with the prequels, Revenge of the Sith is a good movie. All right, I'll give you that. But at minimum, all three of the original trilogy films are good movies. Two of them are great movies. I mean, you also have the greatest sequel of all time in history with Empire Strikes Back. So there's a lot of things going for the original trilogy that I would argue over the prequel trilogy any day. And I definitely would try to make sure my kid knew that. But it would be def it'd be a hard argument for me to have because I'd be like, why would you like the prequels that much, man? Come on, what's going on? What, you think it's better than the originals? Ooh, I, would, I would have to sit them down and just have a lot of, have a movie marathon and show them what good movies are. And say, this this is what you're looking for in a film. And this is what the original trilogy has to offer and whatnot. So it would definitely be a, a long, windy documentary that I'd put out on YouTube. The Insane Commenter asks, what are your thoughts on Mike Zero? If you ask me, he is a clickbait. Oh, he says some, some, some bad words. Honestly, I don't like Mike Zero's channel because I do agree. He is a clickbait kind of person. He does put out stuff. Uh, within the time we've been talking, he's probably put out maybe five six videos, something like that. Uh, honestly, all the stuff he comes out with annoys me because it gives a lot of fans some false hope for these rumors because some of these rumors that he puts out do catch wind and it annoys me. A lot of these rumors, like um, that one from Express.co.uk that we talked about a few weeks ago, a lot of their stuff comes from Mike Zero. And since they're a website and they're a news website and they put out articles on Star Wars, people take what they say seriously and they're going, oh, yeah, George Lucas is back. He's actually back in Star Wars. And now YouTube channels and other news websites start taking this rumor and they start running with it. And it's very dangerous because it gets fans 
excited for something like episode nine, excited for something like episode eight, and expecting certain things. This happened a lot with episode eight, in my opinion, uh, more than episode seven. It, it, honestly, I really think because there were so many questions that we wanted answered in episode eight, because episode seven made us ask these questions, that really brought up the hype for episode eight, in my opinion, in terms of what we want answered. And that's why fans made all these fake rumors and theories and leaks like Mike Zero did. And since all that happened of, hey, Snoke's identity is confirmed is to be coming out in this film. So is Ray's. All this stuff was confirmed by Mike Zero and other all these other people. And these expectations were made by the fandom. And then you go into the movie and it doesn't meet any of them. You're really disappointed. Now, I didn't like the film in general. I know a lot of people just simply didn't like the film. But I definitely think a large part of the backlash has to do with people like Mike Zero. I, I just think Mike Zero is definitely not a um, contribution to the community in a, in a positive way. This next question is from the something shadow. I can't say his whole name. It's weird. Uh, do you miss the EU slash legends? Yeah, I, I do and I don't in a way. There's some really bad arcs in the expanded universe. Everyone acts like it's so perfect. Don't forget, they had a clone of Luke whose name was like Luke. Like, it was an extra U in the name. Oh, that was just awful. I definitely do miss some of the stories from the Expanded Universe. The comic books particularly had a lot of interest for me. The video games went into certain routes that were very interesting. The books itself were always interesting. I mean, there was just a lot that the Expanded Universe had to offer. Especially the Thrawn trilogy. That's such a good, such a good trilogy. And the Darth Plagueis books. There's a lot that I loved about the EU. There's a lot that I didn't like about the EU. Do I miss it? Yeah, I, I do miss it, honestly. Is it a big miss? No, because I can still go back and read them. So it's not that big of a deal for me. I mean, it's like there's some of these books that, you know, are, of course, never going to come out. But for me, one of the positives, and I know people are going to agree with me on this, but I, I do think the new canon does have some stuff to offer. I mean, the new Tarkin book, the, the book that came out, I think, back in 2015, maybe 2016, it was a really good book. I, I liked it. I liked the Tarkin book. That was one of the better Star Wars books that have come out recently. The Lost Stars book, a lot of people like that. I haven't read it yet. There's another one. Uh, the first Thrawn book was really good. The second one was god-awful. But the first one was really good. The Inferno Squadron, that book was pretty good, too. There's definitely some merit with the new Star Wars canon. Some of the comic books have actually been pretty decent when they, when they originally came out. Uh, Son of Dothamir. That also came out under the new canon. That was the first new canon book, uh, comic book, if, I, if I'm correct. I love that book. I, I love that comic book strip. I love the new Darth Vader stuff, too. There are some good comic books and books in general that we have with the new canon under Disney. Are they the best in the world? No. Are they up to the quality of the expanded universe? No, not yet. Will it get there one day? Maybe. And if it does, then I'll look back and say, all right, maybe I won't miss the expanded universe that much. Because those same authors can now have a brand new universe to work on that is actually officially, officially, officially canon. You know, confirmed by everybody up to the highest authority. Because with the old canon, uh, with the old expanded universe, it was canon, but it wasn't canon in George Lucas's Star Wars universe. So the movies and whatnot weren't canon with the expanded universe. So it was kind of weird. Yeah. But now it's all under one little canon thing. So I guess I like that. But I don't know. Maybe one day. We'll get some better Star Wars comic books and books in general. Right now, not so much. So I do miss the Expanded Universe and the Legends books because of some of the stories they had to tell right now. Uh, the next question comes from Malcolm. He asks, why is your YouTube so much smaller than your Instagram? It's because it's harder to grow on YouTube than it is Instagram. You actually have to put a lot more effort in you, you know, uploading daily on YouTube. In terms of what I'm doing, you know, Instagram, you just put up a picture. You know, you can work on a meme. Making a meme isn't that hard. Reporting the news on Instagram isn't that hard. YouTube, you have to edit the videos. For me, now, you know, I write the script on some of the videos that I want to make, you know, or, you know, in terms of videos that I really want to get into a serious discussion with, I'll write the script for it. I write the script for my documentaries and everything like that. There's a lot more effort that goes into YouTube. So it takes more time to put out more videos. You actually have to be you know, really creative and put out a lot more quality content, in my opinion, than you would on Instagram. My Instagram was easier to grow because I built a community. I knew friends and people who were involved. I made, I worked with a lot of people. I just spent a lot of time doing it. I've had that Instagram since I was a freshman in high school and I'm a sophomore in college now. So it's definitely been some time and it's been a long, long time to build up. So 
in the future though my youtube will surpass my instagram and and hopefully actually within the next year or two social blade it's not the greatest uh in terms of being completely ac accurate statistically but it does give you a decent projection of what my future will look like and it has says you know that in five years i should be at seven hundred and fifty thousand, and within a year or two i should be at a hundred thousand and that would be really nice so I'll definitely pass my Instagram eventually, but right now, yeah, my YouTube is the smaller one. But that's okay, because it does make me um, happier, and it is, it is a better job than the Instagram one, in my opinion. The Cup promo puts a nice little comment for me. I appreciate the uh, congratulations on 25K. Uh, they asked this question. Anyway, my question is, what is your thought process when thinking of doing your own channel, and how do you figure out what it is you can offer the Star Wars community? Like I said, it is just finding something that you're unique to. I, I really don't, I really don't like the constant lore style channels out there because it's the same thing over and over again. The expanded universe, you know, like we've talked about, is not canon anymore, and there's just it doesn't add anything. I don't go away from those videos going, I'm really glad I spent my time watching that, and that channel really has something to offer me with those videos when everyone else has those videos. And some of the popular channels that do the lore videos aren't even as good as the ones that are smaller channels that do lore videos. You, you, so it's definitely not something I'm a fan of in terms of making lore stuff. I don't like that. You have to find something that you can offer the community, the Star Wars community. And for, you know, you look at guys like Thor Skywalker. I really like his channel because it's unique and different. Look what he does. He puts polls out on his community tab. And I didn't actually realize this until the last week or two that we both kind of do stuff like this where he puts out community tab polls and he, you know, he basically asks people questions and they vote on what their opinions are. And it's very popular. He has a lot of reaction to this. And he talks about what these opinions are in his videos. He talks about his community tab and his, the polls that he has and everyone's response to those questions that he asks about Star Wars. He turns that into a conversation and he shows his audience's reaction, the most popular comments that were on the polls and everything. That's engaging the community in a way that a lot of people don't do. And I've never seen a channel, at least in the Star Wars community, do something like that. So Right there, Thor Skywalker is doing something unique to his channel, and it's one of the reasons his channel, in my opinion, is probably growing, and definitely, in my opinion, if not the best, one of the best channels out there in terms of the Star Wars community. So something like that is interesting. You have to find what you're good at and what you can offer the Star Wars community. Even through Instagram, you know, for me, it was a place to talk, to debate, without, you know, being an ass or anything like that, even though we all were, because it's the internet. But it's also a place that we put out memes and stuff and we just laugh around, joke around, and talk about Star Wars and just love reporting the news on quick stuff. You know, it's just Instagram, quick little post, and that's it. That's something that for a long time, you know, back in the 90s, 80s, 70s, we never had the social media stuff to really talk about Star Wars like we can now. And so when it comes to being someone who has a little bit more of an influence into the Star Wars community, you definitely have to have something to offer the Star Wars community. You can't just expect it to be a one-sided relationship. The Star Wars community and the fandom are very passionate people, and they will chew you up and spit you out. And I've gotten a lot of love, and I've gotten a lot of hate from these people. And I love it. I love every minute of it. I honestly really do. It's really enjoyable. But I have to offer the, the community something as well for why would they come to my channel. You know, you have to give them a reason why. People like my opinion. People like what I have to talk about. People like the way I, you know, report the news. And some people like the videos that I put out. And that's why some people come to my channel and some people don't. It's just how it is. Uh, the next question they ask, though, is how would you like the seventh season of Clone Wars to finish to wrap up that great animated story? I think Clone Wars Season 7 should kind of end in a way where it goes, this can be the end. But we also could probably do another season, and that would be the final one. I hope Season 7 isn't the final Clone Wars season. I think they should do an eighth one, and that be the send-off. And then after that, because enough time will have passed, you go and work on another show. Like the one with Ahsoka and Sabine going to find Ezra or Thrawn or something like that. Go do something different after Clone Wars is over. I think that's a great idea. Will it happen? I don't know. I definitely think Season 7 won't wrap it up, but I definitely think in terms of with the Ahsoka arc, I think this will be the last time we'll see Ahsoka in the Clone Wars. I don't think if we have a season eight, she'll be in it. And I'm okay with that. Or maybe she'll have like one episode. But overall, yeah, season seven of the Clone Wars, it'll be very interesting. And I hope it's a really good, uh, really good story. This next question is from Tellman. He asks, say something you don't like about the original trilogy. 
Ooh, what do I not like about the original trilogy? The special editions annoy me, honestly. Uh, the Ewoks definitely are something I don't like about the original trilogy. Some of the corniness, some of the dialogue really just isn't that good either. I mean, even look at the Alex Guinness line where he says, he's more machine now than man. It's like, oh, well, okay. Like, some of the dialogue just isn't that great. Or, you know, Governor Tarkin, I recognize your foul stench as soon as I was brought on board. It's like, that's not a good line. <laughs> and George, when he he's never been known to be a good writer in terms of dialogue. He, he's always known this, especially back in the 70s and 80s when he's making these films. Um, he, he brought in Lawrence Kasdan and other people to really help him write the script, especially for New Hope when he was coming and working on that uh, script for the original trilogy. He had two people come in and uh, write and write the dialogue for him, and that really helped the relationship between Han and Leia. So the dialogue is definitely something that I think really needs help in the original trilogy. If there was something I could fix about it, that would be it. As well as the indecisiveness we have between Luke and Leia being related, I wasn't a fan of the love triangle that started in A New Hope and continued in Empire, but then went a really weird route in Episode 6 where it was revealed that you know, Luke and Leia were sister and brother because it was like, alright, well, they kissed in the last one, and I know this is a galaxy far, far away, but incest is still weird, so... Yeah, I, I don't know. There's some, There are some problems with the original trilogy. Tellman asks, are you going to see Captain Marvel? No. I think I've talked about this before. There's so many Marvel movies out now, man. I've seen them all. I remember, I mean, they're not all that good, in, in my honest opinion. In terms of films, I think Marvel's kind of killed the film industry in terms of quality films that come out here. It's always got to be a superhero story. And it's always the same superhero story. The reason Thor Ragnarok was such a good movie compared to the other two movies about Thor, is because it was different. It wasn't the routine, common superhero movie that we got from Marvel. It was something unique and offered a different story and a different take on Thor that was really good, and I really enjoy it. And it's probably one of my favorite Marvel movies. I like the Avengers movies. I like the first one. I like Age of Ultron enough. It's not the greatest, but it's okay. And I like Infinity War. But Doctor Strange was not a good film. Ant-Man and the Wasp was awful. Black Panther is a completely overrated film. There's not a single Iron Man movie where I really want to sit down and just watch one day. They all just bore me now. Uh, the Captain America movies were okay. I'm not going to lie. Those are probably pretty pretty decent up there. Uh, some of the X-Men movies have been good and whatnot, but that's completely different. Overall, there's just so many Marvel movies. Wait, X-Men isn't even Marvel, is it? My bad. Point is, most of these Marvel movies are the exact same. And I'm pretty confident Captain Marvel is going to be the exact same as all the other ones. So I'm not interested in seeing it. I'm definitely not interested in the debates that's been going on about it. I don't know the entire backlash scenario story. I know Brie Larson had said some things people don't like. Uh, other than that, I really don't know what's going on uh, too much. I, there's some things that I have known about that I was interested in, but I'm not going to see it. I don't care to see it. It's not because I don't care that she's a woman or anything like that or anything like that at all i just am tired of watching these marvel movies after endgame i am done with marvel you can take that franchise and do whatever you want with it i'm tired of it one thing that does intrigue me though and kind of makes me laugh is i remember all these years ago when all the marvel fans were talking shit about star wars fans saying we don't want to be like them and now look what you got going on now you got your own little boycott how's it feel it sucks doesn't it <laughs> Uh, next question is from Jedi Master 677 Should Disney continue EU stories and books? Maybe give two universes for fans to follow EU and canon. I really hope we get more Jaina Solo stories. That's not going to happen because it's going to be far too confusing for people to keep up with. I mean, it was already confusing enough with the expanded universe not being canon in George Lucas's eyes, but to a lot of fans, they considered it canon. So you already have that confusion right there. And it being the expanded universe being canon with the Clone Wars show as well, there was some con confusion already. And coming in and buying the franchise like Disney did, and then continuing to make the stories of the expanded universe, and also trying to make new stories with the movies, it really doesn't make sense why you would continue the expanded universe and then continue the canon. Why wouldn't you just make the expanded universe stories that you want to make and just turn them into canon stories? and you wouldn't have to be confused by splitting the two universes. I mean, really, it would just be simpler to make everything canon. I personally wouldn't continue the expanding universe like that. I wouldn't try to do two separate universes. If there were any stories that needed to come out from the expanding universe that, you know, maybe there's a trilogy we haven't finished, 
or maybe there's some stories that we haven't finished yet that we were working on, by all means, put it out and say, hey, this is part of Legends. But other than that, I mean, there's really no point, I mean, anymore. I hate saying it, but there's really, they're really not. It's been, I mean, come on, it's been like five years since the EU has been canon. Oh my god, it's been five years already? Holy shit. Wow, I didn't know it was that long. Uh, Emperor Palpa memes, I like this guy a lot. He, uh, he says, congrats on 25k, I appreciate that, buddy. He says, what era, prequel trilogy, original trilogy, or sequel trilogy would you be in Star Wars, and what planet would you like to live on? I probably, I've always said Coruscant, and I definitely would have to say prequel trilogy. I've already said on Coruscant why, that's because I feel like I can go anywhere and do anything. I have the Jedi Temple there, I have all the city life, and I have, like, all these people I can go out and do different things with and probably go out and live a life. So I think Coruscant's the best place in terms of opportunity in terms of the Star Wars universe. I'd probably have to pick the prequel trilogy era, maybe the even the original trilogy, because I, I don't know what it's like in the sequel trilogy. But if I had to pick an era, I'd probably have to say the prequel trilogy because, it, you know, the technology, A, looks slicker and better. I mean, honestly, you can't say Coruscant doesn't look beautiful during the prequel trilogy. And also you have countless opportunities, like I've said. But the Jedi Order is also still in power. And therefore, you know, I can just kind of rely on the Jedi for the peace and everything. I agree with the Jedi over the Sith. I'd rather have, you know, a, a peaceful democracy, even though, you know, Palpatine took over and everything. But I'd rather have a democracy over than the... Uh, authoritarian government of the empire so i'm definitely more prequel trilogy kind of guy you know the galaxy was at peace and everything sith weren't around that's the kind of world i'd rather live in instead of the empire ruling during the original trilogy and then whatever the hell's going on with the sequel trilogy i don't know what the galaxy looks like in the sequel trilogy that that's my big problem with the sequel trilogy right now as well i mean what the hell's going on the original trilogy you kind of got a vibe of the empire's taking over everything and, but that's been, that was, like, established for years and years and years. Like, you knew that was the backstory. That that was in the opening crawl of, hey, you know, the Rebels are some freedom fighters, basically. They're going, they're going out to try to free the world from the Empire, free the galaxy. You, you got that. You understood that the galaxy was in turmoil because of the original trilogy. But, yeah, in the end, I guess I would have to say the uh, Coruscant and during the prequel trilogy. That'd probably be my uh, best choice. Next question is from That One Smokey. Um... The next question is from that one Smokey. He asks, interested in Jedi Fallen Order. I hate EA as much as the next guy, but to be honest, I just want a good Star Wars game, so I've got my hopes up for it. Respawn is also a pretty damn good developer. Yeah, you're right. Respawn is a really good developer. I've been playing Apex Legends a lot. It's a really good game, and I'm impressed with that game. Respawn did really well with Titanfall as well, which I think is in the Apex Legends universe, so that probably makes sense why I like it so much. But I love both Titanfall games. The first one wasn't amazing. The second one was really good in terms of story. That's definitely an underrated game. If you haven't played it yet, definitely play it. Good campaign, good time. I really enjoyed that. Respawn definitely could make the best game for EA right now with Star Wars. And I can see that happening. I am interested in Jedi Fallen Order. Um, I'm actually interested in... I'm going to be there at Star Wars Celebration to actually look at the, the panel and everything. And I'll see if I can talk to any of the guys who work with Respawn or anything like that. And hopefully I can even get a review copy for Jedi Fallen Order this year so I can review it a little early or play it a little early so I can put out a review as early as possible for you guys. Uh, so hopefully that can happen, but I don't know yet. But yeah, I'm definitely interested in Jedi Fallen Order. I'm excited to see what they have to offer because it's a new story and it's not something that we've already seen before. The main reason I'm so interested in it is because it's something new. Like I've said, I'm not a big fan of the Battlefront franchise from EA and that's because well it's it's a copy of Battlefront 1 and 2 and it's not even that good it's not good at all actually in my opinion so you have this game is something completely new we've never seen it before and I like that and I hope it's something we've never seen before and I hope it's a really good game and it's a modern day Star Wars game with great graphics that we've already had with Battlefront and Battlefront 2 but now we actually get a single player story with it that, that just sounds great I, I love it Unloosed Prism 43 asks, do you prefer episode one over The Last Jedi? Oh man, you're you're asking a tough question. At the moment, yeah. At the moment, I haven't seen The Last Jedi as many times as I've seen episode one. Episode one, for me, is one of those films where it feels like Star Wars. It looks like Star Wars. It just the story, the dialogue, and the execution just missed on what it should have been. If George Lucas really got to make the film the way he wanted it to and have a, a director come in and maybe Lawrence Kasdan write the screenplay for it, it probably would have been a far better film. 
uh, and I definitely think it would have improved it a lot. So episode one in terms of watching it and going, man, it was so close to being what it should have been. And it's just interesting. And there's some parts of episode one that I really do enjoy. And a large part of that maybe because I, I grew up with it. But The Last Jedi for me, since it's so recent and it's so divisive and I'm on the side that really didn't like it, it right now it's just I, I can't enjoy it. I just don't really enjoy it much watching The Last Jedi. And I'm not trying to be an asshole and just shit on it. I just simply don't enjoy it. This next question is from a guy named My Name, which is funny. Uh, his first question is, which is worse, episode one or episode two? Definitely episode two. Uh, the next question he asks is, could you please do an honest video about all good things about The Last Jedi, no matter how short it may be? Okay. Yeah, I'll do it. Uh, I'll, I'll, it may, may take a while, but I'll do it. Storyteller22 asks, if given the chance to pitch anything to Lucasfilm Story Group, what would it be? Be it a movie, trilogy, cartoon, or live-action TV show, etc. Oh, man, if I could pitch anything to Lucasfilm Story Group. Oh, man. If the, mm, I get, yeah, it would have to be a trilogy, an Old Republic trilogy. That's exactly what it would be. I would have to work on the, the story and the script that I'd want. But it would it would be that. Honestly, it really would. Byron Schwartz asked, do you love democracy? Oh, yeah. I love democracy. I love the Republic. My allegiance is to Republic. To democracy! The Mad Commenter asks again. The Mad Commenter asks, Do you think Anthony Daniels will play C-3PO in Clone Wars Season 7? Did he play him in the other seasons? I don't I don't think he did. I've never listened to the other seasons and really like picked up on his voice as being Anthony Daniels. I always thought they just brought in uh, another voice actor. If they've never used him before, then I don't think they'll be using him in Season 7. If they have used them before, then they will be using them in Season 7. If that makes any sense, then that's my answer. Stormtrooper Production says, Please say the C word. Coruscant. The insane commenter asks, Would you rather get shot in the balls for 700 years, non-stop in the dark, or watch The Last Jedi for 70,000 years, non-stop in the dark? Okay. Am I living through these gunshots? Like, if I'm if, if they're going to kill me and I'm going to lose blood, then I'll take that. Because that means I just die faster. I'd rather just get this over with. Uh, if it's if I live through all that physical pain, then I'd rather just watch The Last Jedi. Because while I may be going through mental pain, I'd get so used to the movie. It, it definitely would be torture up to a certain point. No, no matter what movie it would be, watching a movie for 70,000 years nonstop in the dark. How am I watching something in the dark? Wait, like... Oh, okay. Am I seeing the movie? Like, is it watching like a movie theater in the dark kind of thing? Seventy thousand years. Am I am I gonna live all seventy thousand years? I mean, there's a lot of variables that are going into this. Uh, I I guess if I had to pick though, if I get to die, it would be getting shot for seven hundred years. If I get to die, because that means I get to die within the first like ten minutes. If I don't get to die by getting shot, then I'd pick watching the Last Jedi, because I don't die. And I don't get any physical pain of being shot. So that is my answer. The Insane Commenter asks another question. What show do you like the best? And he puts out four options. The Simpsons, The King of the Hill, Family Guy, American Dad, Bob's Burgers. Are we really sticking to Star Wars here, guys? No, I'm playing. Uh, honestly, number one would probably have to be American Dad. Number two... I know people aren't going to like this, but I'd say Family Guy, number three, The Simpsons, number four, King of the Hill, number five, Bob's Burgers. I understand The Simpsons is probably the best show out of all of them. I've just never been the biggest fan. King of the Hill is okay. I grew up watching Family Guy. Now that I'm older, though, I appreciate American Dad a little more. I've been watching both of those on my Hulu account, honestly. And so right now, I like those a lot, but all those are good shows, except for Bob's Burgers. Aaron K puts a question. Sorry if I sound impatient, but why do Let's Talk Star Wars videos always take a long time to get uploaded? Honestly, it's just because I'm busy. There's a lot of other Star Wars videos that I'm working on that you guys don't know about and stuff that I'm working on for, you know, real world stuff like college and I'm also training at night. You know, I do jiu-jitsu and MMA at night as well. And then on the weekends I work. I have a job on the side, so it's... I'm not busy busy, but I'm busy enough. So it takes me some time, yeah. And I definitely should probably... Speed it up a little bit, and I do apologize about any uh, any inconsistency in terms of uploading, but I, I do my best. Joe does stuff. Ask, I believe I heard that Kiati Mundi was the only Jedi allowed to go against not having a lover slash partner or family rule, but the source I found didn't explain why. 
Would you be willing to answer that one? I think that's EU legend stuff, so it's not canon anymore. But the reason is because Kiati Mundi's species is very rare, and I don't think there's a lot of males. I think the male gender is actually really rare for that species. So since he's a male, he's allowed to have multiple wives in his species so they can reproduce and keep you know his species alive. So that's why, in terms of uh, the expanded universe... Uh, Edward Turner asks, how long will Star Wars continue into the future? Oh, buddy, it's going to go on for a while. It, Star Wars is never going to die. Even with George Lucas in charge, it was never going to die. They're always going to be putting out new shows, uh, maybe new spinoff movies or something like that in the future. There, there's a lot of stuff that's still going to come out with Star Wars. Daniel Talon asks, in your opinion, is the story of the Force Unleashed video game, excluding the sequel, better than the story of the Rebels animated series? Please explain why. Is it better? I mean, Rebels, for me, the problem with Rebels is it ends with Ezra, Sabine, Ahsoka alive. And for me, I'm like, you know, I feel like these people would help out Luke or should try to help out the Rebellion. Why weren't they in the original trilogy? Why weren't they in those films? My thought process has always been they have to die. <laughs> Honestly, that's just what happens, has to happen. My thought process was always they have to be dead in this scenario. My thought process was always they have to be dead in the original trilogy so it could make sense in terms of my, my I guess, my rules. Uh, but I think now that I've gotten older, I've kind of realized I might be wrong in that sense, but I'm not entirely sure. The Force Unleashed, the story is really good. The problem with The Force Unleashed, though, compared to the Rebels TV show, is the Force Unleashed is hella overpowered. Starkiller, like, takes down a Star Destroyer in the middle of the air. Like, that was crazy. He can shoot lightning out like crazy and takes out Vader. I mean, come on. It's really overpowered, honestly. And he's always yelling. Come on. Eh, whatever. Uh, he also asked, also, if you were in charge of the story in this part of the timeline, what tweaks would you apply to each? All right, now see, now you're getting into the stuff where I was just talking about it. Yeah, I would definitely fix the Force Unleashed, um, the overpowered stuff. I haven't played the Force Unleashed in a long time. The story was always the best part about the first game. The gameplay was also really good. The second one was eh, but like you, like you said in your comment, we're not really talking about that one. In terms of starting up the Rebellion, I definitely think the first Force Unleashed game was the most interesting. You know, he was the Sith apprentice of Darth Vader, and he goes around and he recruits everybody like Bill Organa and everything. I remember that that mission on the Wii. That was kind of interesting. I think I think he fought against the Mandalorians, and it was only on the Wii, but not on the other ones. So the Force Unleashed for me definitely had the best story. Rebels built the best characters, in my opinion. You know, Sabine is now a character that a lot of people enjoy. So is Ezra. Kanan was a character who got better as time went on. I'm not a big fan of Zeb. I mean, he's okay. I'm not saying he's bad, but he's just like, eh, him and Chopper for me were just whatever, like toss-away characters. Um, even though I know a guy who's actually related to the uh, character, to the voice actor of Zeb. It's it's not like Rebels was the worst show in the world, but if I could have changed it up a little bit, fix the animation. I don't think the animation was all that great. Fix the story, take away some fillers. I mean, it's not like it was the worst show in the world. It definitely had a lot of merit. It definitely didn't execute it the way it should have been. If it was more Clone War style kind of a show, I think it would have been far better. But I definitely think they kind of Disney-fied it in a way, if you know what I'm talking about. And I think a lot of you will understand what I'm saying. Jesse Pinkman asks, that's a really good name. I love the Breaking Bad series. What are your thoughts on Lando returning in Episode Nine? I'm excited. My problem with him coming back, though, in Episode Nine is that it's so late into the trilogy... I think if they're going to give him a small role, which rumor has that he does have a small role, that is the way to go. And I think it's a good idea. Hopefully he can talk about Luke or Leia or Han or something like that. That would be interesting to hear him talk about what happened in the past. I would like to know where he's been for all this time. So I'm excited to see what happened with Lando. And I'm excited to see Billy D. Williams come back as Lando. So yes, I'm very excited to see Lando in Episode Nine and interested what his story has been. Uh, then this next question is from, I can't say your name, I'm sorry. Was using an army of clones like slavery by the Republic? Uh, that's a philosophical kind of question that we have to get into. Uh, I would argue, my personal opinion, and this is not knowing the entire backstory on the biology, the expanded universe, on how cloning works or anything like that. 
yes, I think it is kind of slavery. You're breeding these humans, you're breeding these people just to fight. And the question is, is their life worth, you know, that of a Jedi or that of an average civilian or something like that? That's one of the interesting things I've always kind of thought about is, you know, we have a lot of people who love some of these clones like Cody, Rex, Fives, Heavy. All these people are, you know, they're great characters. They have good arcs. But for me, they're like cannon fodder. They were bred for a single purpose by Palpatine to be used in this war. So for me, it's always kind of diminished my connection with them. To be like, huh, you don't really mean anything in the grand scheme of things. So I, I've always had a problem with that. Were they you was it basically slavery by the Republic? In a way, yes, but not by the Republic, by Palpatine. Palpatine's the one who brought brought them in and set this all up and kind of tricked it into it. And it's it's one of those things where like it looks like the clones don't really care too much. And so the question is, are they just like droids? Because droids, you know, they didn't really they're programmed to do whatever they did and the chips that were in the clone said probably was the exact same thing. So is it slavery or is it just another tool? It goes into one of those things where what do the clones think? Are the clones okay with it? And if they are, then by all means, go ahead, free will. But if they're not, if they're not okay with serving, then they shouldn't. But then, you know, they're called a deserter. I think they talked about this in the show. So I don't know. It's a good question. Maybe someone... I don't have all the information to really talk about it. That's my problem. That same person asked a question afterwards. What do you think of an Obi-Wan live action series instead of a movie? And he's referring to the rumor that's been going around that they were going to do a Star Wars live action Kenobi show on Disney Plus streaming service instead of the movie that was rumored to be made. Remember, all the signs are pointing to yes for that movie. They were getting into production. They had rumored writers, a director. It looked like everything was set. And even in the even in the reports when they said they canceled it, that was one of them that got canceled. That specifically, that one in the Boba Fett film, were two spinoff live action movies that were canned, postponed for the minute. And the rumor is that that's going to be turned into a live action series. I would prefer a movie. Just one quick little story. It's a hit or miss, and that's it. If it's a good spinoff film, let's go do other spinoff films. But if it's a bad one, then it's like, all right, well, you obviously can't do it, and let's just stick on the shows. I think the problem with making a show for Obi-Wan is if you're going to do it like The Mandalorian, where you have different directors and everything, you're going to have different kind of character from Obi-Wan. And I don't like that. His character should remain consistent and the same, and mixing it up with the show might really mess it up. If you have a movie, if he's out of character, he's only out of character for that one story and that one movie. But if he's out of character for a show, he could be out of character for one episode, two episodes, three, a whole season, the next season every season, you never know. So I, I really would prefer a movie instead of a live action series. Star Wars started from the movies and spin-off movies, in my opinion, have been the best part uh, since the Disney has taken over. At least with Rogue One and Solo. They're not the best films, but for me it's like, if you can get more films like these that are just 40% better, 30% better, I will be content for the rest of my life. Like honestly, just make Star Wars films that are just better than those two and, and you'll be pretty good. This one guy named Curtis YZ asked, Do you think it's possible Dooku was trying to overthrow Sidious for light side reasoning in his head, like Revan-ish? Maybe. I mean, Dooku definitely had fundamental and philosophical differences with the Jedi Council, and that's why he left. He was part of that, what, Forgotten Twelve or something like that in the uh, Jedi Temple. They had a statue of him that Obi-Wan was looking at in Attack of the Clones in that library scene. I'm not sure Dooku was doing anything in terms of light side. I do think he was interested. In, I do think he was interested in overthrowing Sidious, in a way. But overall, I don't know his goal that much. I, I wasn't very interested with the character of Count Dooku, honestly. And I, I hate saying that. It's just that he was a boring character, in my opinion. So I don't think he was trying to do anything for the light side. I think he was looking for power, and I think he was looking for knowledge in a way, because he does seem like one of those guys who just wants to be, you know, knowledgeable. He was a knowledgeable, rich guy, and this was one of the ways he could go about it. And he just disagreed with the Jedi. And you know, in his mind, he's probably doing the right thing for the galaxy. Uh, I don't think Sidious thought that at all. I don't think he cared about what was right or wrong for the galaxy. I think Dooku, on the other hand, was thinking the Separatist movement and possibly him ruling the galaxy or you know, letting the Separatists rule while he is the 
dark side master. He's the Sith Lord of all Sith Lords. I think for him, that's making the best world possible. So maybe. I don't know. Trevor Beast 454 asks, Do you consider the 2008 animated movie Star Wars The Clone Wars to be an official Star Wars movie? Why or why not? I don't, because A, it's not live action. B, it was a set of episodes, I think four or five episodes, basically mixed into one movie, and it was just awful. <laughs> it really was just awful. So I don't think it's a movie. I don't think it's a good movie, and I definitely don't want it to be officially a part of the Star Wars thing. I don't want it to make a Star Wars list on ranking my best Star Wars movies and having to include that one. If I could avoid talking about that film, I would actually prefer it. Brian E. asks, Will Boss get his own movie? Please make it happen. No, I don't think there's that much interest in Boss. He was really cool in the Robot Chicken Star Wars, though. I really like him in that. Uh, Look Up Motorsports asks, Do you think we'll see a clone Jedi in Clone Wars Season 7? A clone Jedi? Yeah, no. That would be crazy. I mean, it's pretty cool to think about. I think, isn't there something about that in the, uh... Wait, no, um... Yeah, the evil, the evil Jedi... Sabaoth, right? Sabaoth was a clone, right? I could have sworn he was a clone. Huh, I don't know. It's been a minute. But I don't think we'll see one in Season 7. If you do, it would be kind of cool if it was Master Sabaoth. Uh, the Mad Commenter asks, you want to buy some Death Sticks? No, you don't want to sell me any Death Sticks. Talky Flower asks, have you ever seen Dragon Ball? If so, what's your favorite saga? Uh, are you talking about Dragon Ball like when Goku was young or Dragon Ball Z like when they were older? I'm just going to say in general... My favorite saga is the Frieza saga. After that, it got crazy. I, I stopped caring after the Frieza saga. And the only reason I stopped caring after that is because it's, you know, it's so confusing. You have the GT one that's going on that happened that was awful. And, and then you have Brawly, the new movie, which is different from the original movie or something. Like, different timelines. And then you got Lord Beerus going on. There's so much. And then you have Frieza's brother, Cooler. And then you have his father, King Cold. I mean, you got his mother, Refrigerator. I don't understand. There, there was so much confusion going on with the Dragon Ball stuff. So I was, con- I was content after the Frieza Saga. Frieza Saga was great. I love the G-Force, or whatever they were called. The Z-Force, whatever. They were funny as hell. Frieza was a very interesting villain. Cell was cool, don't get me wrong. The androids were really cool. There's a lot of good stuff that happens after the Frieza Saga. I'm just thinking that... I just think that it's more or less the same stuff after Frieza. And I think Frieza was the original bad guy that Goku had to really power up to beat and everything. And I, I really like that. This guy named Django Fett HFH asks, Do you think Jar Jar Binks is a Sith or at least Force sensitive? No, I think that's just something that fans make up to kind of make the prequels or make Jar Jar seem better than what they are. I mean, he there's no way he would be. I mean, that would just be stupid. That would be so stupid. It would be funny, but it would be so stupid. It's something that if George did, I feel like he would have done it because of the reaction to Jar Jar. I think he would have been like, oh, you don't like Jar Jar from episode one, huh? Oh, okay, well, he's he's actually Darth, he is the Phantom Menace, assholes. That's what you didn't know. Yep, take that. Like, I think that's how petty George would have been uh, if we were in an alternate universe or something, and I'm glad he's not. So, Jar Jar, no, is not Force-sensitive. He is not a Sith Lord or anything like that. I'm glad he's not, because that would be so weird. Cali Lover 47 asks, Thoughts on Red Dead 2? I loved it. Oh, man, I love so... I haven't finished it yet. I think I, I just finished around um, Chapter 5. Uh, de- I, definitely the big spoiler alert part. Um, and I had I had the, um, the good part of that one, so I was happy with that. A definitely emotional kind of game. Definitely a good game, storytelling, immersive-wise. I loved it. I, I thought it was a very good game. I'm not a big fan of cowboy gunsling and stuff but this this game was a masterpiece by far one of the best games I've ever played in my life and I'm, I'm really happy with it I would love if Rockstar could make a Star Wars game like Red Dead Redemption 2 just you know far better and a, the story for me with Red Dead at the end kind of lost me a little bit and was definitely something that disappointed me in, in a way and not like a, it was awful I was just kind of like oh it had a, so much more potential than what you let it be. And that kind of sucked. But overall, it's still a great game. This next question is from Winston Shi. He asks, do you trust Rotten Tomatoes even less after Captain Marvel debacle? Honestly, yes and no. The Captain Marvel thing, for me, it just is a representation of one side of 
fans who just don't like what's going on with Marvel, I guess, and don't like what's going on with Star Wars, because they did it with The Last Jedi. Is it a good indication of what the movie's merit is? No. I think you have to go to different places and go to actually film critics and even some YouTube channels that you trust and look at their opinion and look at the overall reaction from people who've actually gone and see the movie and people who aren't really biased. You know, you have people who didn't like the movie going in, you had people who already liked the movie when they went in. So it's it's an interesting it's an interesting topic with Captain Marvel, and I'm glad I've stayed out of it, honestly. I'm glad I've been able to kind of watch it from the outside. One thing I will I will say that I did think was interesting, and that is the people who are boycotting the film are saying they don't want to see the Captain Marvel movie, and they say, instead of seeing that film, we're going to go see that Alita Battle Angel movie. I really think that's a good move. And the reason I say that is because I've noticed some of the people who are on the side of Captain Marvel and Brie Larson are saying, if you're boycotting this film and you're not going to go see it, it's because you're sexist. Well, the great way to counter that is by saying, hey, I'm not going to watch Captain Marvel because of the SJW propaganda or the feminist stuff, whatever they're saying. And they're saying, instead of going to see that, I'm going to show you that I'm not sexist and that it's not because she's a female, and I'm going to go see this Alita Battle Angel movie. I thought that was a really good move on whoever decided to go do that instead. Whoever started that little movement to go see that movie instead of Captain Marvel, in terms of moral superiority, I thought that was probably the best move they could have made. In terms of saying, hey, it's not a gender thing. Look at this female character. that She's the lead of this movie. I like this movie because it wasn't political. I don't like your movie because it's political. That's the difference. I just thought that was a really good move and uh, something that definitely was like, wow, that is impressive and definitely caught my eye as something that other... We, we need to do as a community more often. We as Star Wars fans need to kind of pull a nice moral move like that that really shows our side is uh, not about gender or anything. It's actually about storytelling or you know lack of political involvement into the franchise. Stuff like that. So that's my personal opinion. Max Art asks, how to possibly deal with anti-SJWs in a discussion, one that constantly complain, not the ones that have good reasons and let it at that. Well, at least hopefully uh, your lesson's kind of was worded differently, buddy. But uh, how do you deal with anti-SJWs in a discussion, the people that constantly complain? I understand what Max is asking here because if you do look at the both sides that we have in the fandom right now, you have people who are the anti-SJWs and then you have the SJWs. And those two categories can be classified as what I classify them as the pro-Disney crowd, which is the SJWs, and then you have the anti-Disney crowd, which is also, ironically, the anti-SJWs. Now, they're interchangeable. There's some people who are, you know, social justice warriors that don't like Disney, and there's people who aren't social justice warriors that do like Disney. You have mix. Now, that's not to say there aren't variables. That's not to say that people who are SJWs have to be fans of Disney. There are people who are SJWs who don't like Disney, and there are people who are not SJWs who do like Disney. But the point is, in generalizing, I feel like this is the most common trend. Anti-SJW happens to be anti-Disney. Pro-SJW has to be pro-Disney. And when you're dealing with these people in discussions, the anti-SJWs, the biggest point that I always say when you're talking to these people is whoever throws the first insult loses. And the reason being is when you're insulting someone and you're actually trying to have a good conversation in terms of discussing uh, the aspects of Star Wars that you like, that you don't like, or, or anything like that, even with the Captain Marvel movie that we've been talking about, with anything that deals with discussion of what you're trying to have, whether it be political, whether it be uh, film-wise, you know, something that you want to talk about cinema or comic books, if you're dealing with someone with the other side, if you're dealing with someone who likes The Last Jedi and you don't like The Last Jedi, if you come out and say, The Last Jedi is trash and you're a shitty movie critic because you like it, yeah, then you're not having a discussion, you're just being a dick. You actually need to talk to these people, and that's what I try to do myself, and that's what I, I hope a lot of you do as well. And I know a lot of my subscribers are actually really good about this, but people who come into the channel and aren't here all the time, some people are a little insulting. And if you reply with insulting stuff, then you're going to receive also insulting comments as well. So when you're talking to these people, definitely don't insult them. Try to find reasoning. That's one of the greatest things you can do is just find, try to find some reasoning and say, I understand why you liked it, but here's why I didn't like it. The anti-SJW crowd is, is really funny in my opinion now because they're doing exactly what they don't like the SJWs doing, and that is getting triggered all the time. And, and now that's kind of what become 
that's kind of what's become both sides of the fandom in terms of you know who gets triggered first it's almost like everyone gets triggered by something you know the, the, these anti SJW guys who for the long time have been trolling the SJW saying you get triggered too easily are now the ones who ironically also get way triggered too easily so it's kind of funny how things have changed in my opinion within the past 2 years i mean back in 2017 the star wars fandom was the toxic one and the SJWs were the toxic ones now it's both sides and now it's not just the star wars fandom as you can see now it's the marvel fandom even the dc fandom has kind of uh, reached an interesting uh, passage right now and so it's it's definitely an interesting time to be a nerd and be on the internet it's weird to see where we're gonna go in the future within even the next three to five years uh, with the way things are constantly changing this next question is would you rather watch all of the michael bay transformers movies or the last jedi five times that is definitely a tough one because it's like, would I rather watch five different versions of a really bad movie, or would I rather watch one movie that has not been a movie that I've enjoyed five times consistently? That's a tough question to answer. From from just looking at it, I would argue I'd probably rather see the Transformer movies, not because they have more merit than The Last Jedi. I'd probably argue that The Last Jedi is... a uh, in terms of cinematography and in terms of music, is a far better film than those five other Transformers movies. Michael Bay, we all we all know the Michael Bay argument. Focuses way too much on explosions. I can't watch... I mean, it's one of those things where if I watch all five Transformers movies, if I watch them all in a row, I'm going to be mind-boggly... I, I'm going to be bored out of my mind. Because they're like two hours apart. So that's that's ten hours of my day. That's basically my entire day spent just watching those movies so it's either that or spend my entire day watching the last jedi now and due to repetition of seeing the last jedi five times i would have to pick michael bay's transformers movies but the repetition of story in those movies would annoy the hell out of me too because if you look at transformers movies it's the same story every time the autobots find this new villain that just happens to be further back in time than from what they previously arose to. The first one, Megatron landed in the glacier, Sam Witwicky's grandfather found him, whatever. The second one, that was Revenge of the Fallen, right? The Fallen was in the pyramids or something, and he came way back when, back when the natives were around or something, in Egypt. I can't remember the, I can't remember the entire story. The third one was Dark of the Moon, I believe, and that one was about... The, the, them going even f further back in time. Well, not further back in time. It wasn't... Well, yeah, they went to the moon. That that was before the, the moon landing. So, yeah, even further back in time. They went to the moon, and then the moon landing happened, and they discovered there was Autobots or Decepticons, whoever the hell, were on the moon, and that's going to bring Cybertron to the planet Earth. And then the fourth one. The fourth one was... Uh, ah, dude, I'm not going to lie. I can't remember the fourth one at all. I cannot remember that one to save my life. Uh, that was something about dinosaurs, which was even further back in time, because the creators were the ones who came to Earth before the dawn of dinosaurs and put that shit on. I mean, what more can we do with the story in Transformers that can be different? Come on, Michael. Are you writing the script? That's my question. Is he is he doing a George Lucas, or he just controls too much? Anyways, the next question is from Mr. Woods. Mr. Woods asks, now, who would you love to make your wife from the Star Wars mythos? That's a pretty good question. I don't know a lot about every single female character in the Star Wars universe or every male character in terms of their personality and, and like, how I would deal with them in, in terms of conversation. You know, we always say, oh, we like these characters, but how would you actually interact with these characters if they were actually real? If I had to pick a girl from the get-go, let's say we're going off of the three main female protagonists we have in the Star Wars universe. We have uh, Leia, we have Padme, we have Rey. Out of those three, I would have to marry Padme because I feel like she has a, a better head on her shoulders. She seems level-headed. She's into politics, so am I, and she seems to be pretty decently smart, and that's nice. Uh, I, I don't think uh, there's much complaints I have for her, I, I guess. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I guess I would pick Padme, in a way. I, I really don't know who I would try to wife up in the Star Wars universe. Year-long giant ask. Question, if you had a chance to change the creative direction of the sequels, characters in the original trilogy cast, what would you have done? I think I get qu this question every time in terms of what would I do with Episode 8, Episode 7, Episode 9. Now it's what would I do for the creative direction of the sequels. 
It's definitely something that would take me a while to sit down and really think, what do I want the story to be about? And then I have to think about the approach to that story. Because J.J. Abrams and Ryan Johnson took two very different story approaches when it came to writing their movies. J.J. Abrams said he didn't want to be trapped in a bubble and you know he wants to make sure the fans would react to it well or something like that. It's something to do with the fans. Ryan Johnson, on the other hand, put himself into a bubble and said, I'm not going to care what anyone's reaction to this is. We're here to make a story. And I respect that in a way. I, re I really respect the fact that he's like, hey, I don't care what the reaction is. We're here to make a story. However, when you're dealing with a Star Wars fandom, you do have to factor in the reaction, uh, considering you might have a future franchise on your hand. This is something where it's like, I have to build... It's all It's all one act. That's how George wanted it to be it, with, with the original trilogy. The second film in the saga was meant to build up the hype for the third one. It's almost meant to have a cliffhanger. So I have to find a rhythm with these films if I'm making my own trilogy, especially the sequels. Episode 7 is more or less going to be the exact same pace and the exact same nostalgia factor of I'm trying to bring you back into the Star Wars franchise. I'm trying to get you familiar with the original trilogy of Star Wars. Because for me, that's where the magic happened. And I, I like the feel of the original trilogy. The feel of the original trilogy is a lot different from the sequels and the prequels. And so I would try to capture that feeling again, but also go to a different part. I wouldn't focus on the original trilogy cast as much. It would definitely be about them passing the mantle, which is what the sequels was supposed to be about. But they really strayed from that. It was really kind of disappointing what we've had so far, in my opinion, in terms of the stories that could have been told, that should have been told, and the ones that we had. This next question comes from, you know I had to do it to him. He says, favorite prequel meme? Dude, there's a lot. As a guy who has run a Star Wars Instagram account for the longest time, I, I think there's so many prequel memes that I've seen over the years that I, I can't really pick a favorite one. There's not many times where I actually look at a meme and I laugh out loud. And if there is, those are some of my favorites. Uh, some of the best ones on my my Instagram account itself, if I look at like the most liked ones, those do happen to be some of the funniest ones, I will admit. So there are some that I, I like more than others by far. The Obi-Wan Hello There memes have kind of gotten old for me. I, I definitely think Reddit has driven every meme that is good into the ground. And what's funny about the prequel memes is that it really just comes from bad dialogue from the prequels. So if I can just find, if I'm watching the prequels, and I've watched them, I think, a week or two ago. When I was watching them, it's just interesting to see all the memes that have come out from those. And it doesn't ruin the movie, but for a lot of fans nowadays, a lot of fans who actually like the prequels, they like it because of the memes. And so it's interesting to see how that kind of has helped change the perception of the prequels. Mobius Leader 007 asks, is there any characters from the sequels that you think would have worked well in the old EU? I wanted to mix it up since the questions are, what EU character should be canon is overdone. I appreciate that. I appreciate you noticing that and asking a unique question. Is there any character from the sequels that you think would have worked well in the old EU? There, there's a lot of new characters from the sequels. One of them that I would say would work great in the old EU, the old expanded universe from the start, is Snoke. The, the perfect mystery character of, who the hell is this guy? Where did he come from? How did this all happen? That works very well. And a lot of stuff happens like that with the EU in general. You do have these people who are like mysterious of who is their secret identity. But I think Snoke is a, is a good character in terms of that aspect of having a mysterious vibe to him. I like that aspect. I know Kylo Ren, some people say he's a ripoff of Darth Cadus, but I think he's his own unique character as well. That's definitely interesting. Finn, Finn before The Last Jedi, and Finn in The Last Jedi itself, is a, he's an okay character. But I thought his character arc was a little more interesting in Episode 7. And it definitely was going somewhere in Episode 8, especially when he was about to die. And then they, you know, kind of ruined that for him. But overall, I think Finn also would be an interesting character in the EU. The new characters in Star Wars aren't the worst things in the world. It's just their execution hasn't been that great. You know, I don't, I'm not connected with any of the new characters at all. And I'm going into the ninth film. Like, I'm just kind of like, oh, I don't really care about them anymore. I like Poe, and I like Finn. I mean, Ray's not... Ray wasn't bad for me until Episode 8. I, I didn't stop liking Ray until Episode 8. That's what kind of ruined my, her character for me. So I think all the new characters in general could definitely work in the Expanded Universe. They can all provide their own unique stories. It's not like I hate these characters so much, and I hate these sequels so much, that even the characters are forbidden to be in the Expanded Universe. No, I definitely think... 
these characters. Finn offers the int- interesting story of he's a guy who wants to run away from everything. I mean, he literally is like, hey, fuck that. I'm getting out of here. Good luck. And let's not pretend like we don't know a lot of people who would do that. And a lot of us ourselves would do that. I mean, honestly, we all say we want to go on an adventure and some people always act like they're big and bad. But when it comes down to it, hey man, those gunshots start going at you. You're going to haul tail and get the hell out of there. And that's what you have a difference with Finn. Of Finn's trying to get away from all the danger. Poe, on the other hand, he's he kind of brings in the danger and he charges in. And Poe's character arc was a little more interesting in The Last Jedi. Except the fact that It wasn't so much of his arc as he needs to build character or he needs to progress as a character. His arc was he is an idiot and he is too stupid because he goes in, you know, without thinking and that's his arc and therefore he's stupid and we need to fix that. It's like that's just not an arc in my opinion. That's just making him look like a stupid character. And for me that wasn't much. I mean, there's there's a difference between having an obstacle and having to overcome that as a character and being stupid and having to become and having to overcome your own stupidity as a character. And that's what Rose and Finn did in The Last Jedi when it came to Canto Bite. They were stupid enough to park on the beach instead of, you know, go park where everyone else parks or something. I mean, it's, it's just, that's not an obstacle. That's just being stupid. The insane commenter asked another question. Besides Indiana Jones and Star Wars, Lucasfilms basically made nothing popular. Why do you think that is? Another thing Lucas made popular and worked on, and now when you're saying Lucasfilm, are you just saying the company? Or are you saying George Lucas himself? Because I can go in, I can go into details all day about what George Lucas has done for the film industry and different things. When it comes to Lucasfilm, the company, since they are a product of George Lucas, they also have had a lot of influence in the film industry and made things too popular. I definitely think you might want to look more into Lucasfilm and what they've done in the past. Because yes, Indiana Jones and Star Wars are extremely popular franchises. They're also not the only franchises that Lucasfilm is known for and has done work on. So definitely look into some of that stuff. Because Lucas, George Lucas, and Lucasfilm have worked on so many movies. Apocalypse Now, that was directed by Francis Ford Coppola. That story is something that was inspired with George Lucas. That George Lucas had you know some influence over Apocalypse Now. There's a lot of influence that this man and these films have had that people don't realize it's really hard to comprehend for a lot of people just how big of a deal george lucas and lucasfilm is and was and i think it's something that i need to work on in terms of telling everybody and showing everybody which i will you know i've like i've said i've been working on a lot of documentaries for this channel just show what really has changed from George Lucas himself. So, Devin asks, if you could redo a film in Star Wars and make it canon, which film would it be and how would you improve it? Well, there's a lot of Star Wars films that I feel like could be worked on. I would argue every single prequel film is not perfect and it could use improvement. I would argue the Return of the Jedi film could use some improvement as well. It's not the worst. It's it's a solid B, but it's not an A. It's not an A-, minus, but it's a solid B. The sequels, each one of them can be improved. Every spinoff film, there's so many of these films that actually could be improved. And in terms of redoing a film, I have to, I would have to pick one that I think could actually offer the best story in terms of what would happen in the future. Like, like the prequels, you could look at. I would say, if I could redo Attack of the Clones and make that a better film and a great film, then that would really bring up the prequel trilogy in my eyes because for me the prequel trilogy has one good movie and two really bad movies and for me that's something that i i don't understand why a lot of people say i love the prequel so much when i look at attack of the clones and the phantom menace but i do think if the phantom menace was was a better film just a little bit and of course attack of the clones was redone and improved you'd have a great trilogy you but you don't in my opinion so for me i i'd have to pick attack of the clones just simply because I feel like I could fix so much and redo some things. Take out the love story. Don't film everything digitally. As as revolutionizing as that was, the editing on that film, the, the, the pacing in it, there were so many things that went wrong with that film itself. If I'm going to be honest, it's one of those things where I have to look at which one do I want to pick. Do I want to pick the worst one of the franchise? Do I want to pick the one that I personally had the most problems with? The one that I personally had the most problems with, of course, is going to be The Last Jedi. And if I could improve that, it really would just be the story element. I mean, if I could just get someone to write the story for The Last Jedi and then write the screenplay for it, then I should be pretty good. Because the pacing of the film 
was not good. The story of it, in my opinion, didn't make any sense. Luke's, Luke's character didn't make any sense. I would definitely improve on those aspects of it, of the story. Get someone to write the screenplay, the dialogue, and actually flesh out the story a little more. Because the dialogue wasn't the problem in The Last Jedi, it was the humor. That's another thing I would take away as well, is the humor. The length, as well, was an issue, and I, I warned everybody from the start. I told everybody when that film runtime came out, hey, this might not be a good thing because, you know, the last film that was this long was Attack of the Clones, and that was awful. So, in terms of which one I have the personal problems with, I'd pick The Last Jedi to redo it, just to see if I could improve it. And I'm pretty sure I could, in terms of what I would want to offer. And it would improve, in my opinion, in my eyes, I would find improvement with it. I'm not sure if the fandom would. I'm sure, in hindsight, people would like the improvements I made in terms of Luke's character. It, now the question would be, what would I do in terms of story with Episode Eight? And that's the million dollar question of where to go. Because when you have a franchise like that, you have endless possibilities in terms of creative freedom. However, you are restrained by the rules of Star Wars. And that's something that I, I know everyone here listening knows, that there are rules to making Star Wars films. But narrowing down those rules and actually writing them down is very complicated to think about and actually do. It's unwritten rules, in a way, is what you could call them. We actually have unwritten rules when it comes to making a Star Wars film. And I think I should make a video on uh, what those unwritten rules are, so we'll work on that one day. Crocodile Key Productions asks, Do you think there's one smart First Order officer, and why are the TIE Fighters and Special Forces pilots idiots that can't defend a big planet from 12 fighters and destroy a slow-moving big target ship? Now, he's talking about The Force Awakens. There's like 12... X-Wings that come in and destroy the planet. And yes, while that was silly, you could also make the same argument with the Death Star. The Death Star, though, had its little turbo lasers, and that was their argument, I assume. And they did send out a lot of TIE pilots. I mean, TIE fighter pilots, a lot of them died. So it definitely wasn't, you know, a walk in the park for the Rebellion. For the Resistance, though, it definitely makes you wonder, do they not have any big ships? I mean, you saw it in the Episode Eight. Where was that? And why is the Resistance so small? If they're protecting the galaxy, I mean, they really only had, like, one planet. And that planet, well, they evacuated, and that was really it. I mean, the entire Resistance, for apparently saving the galaxy, it, it just really kind of dwindled, honestly. Compared to what they had with the Rebellion, look at all those ships and everything. And then you get to Resistance, when they're at the height of their power, in Episode 7, they just kind of dwindle into nothing in Episode 8. It's kind of crazy. But anyways... It does seem like the First Order are either a bunch of idiots or a bunch of angry assholes. So there's definitely a lot of uh, anger that goes on with the First Order. Uh, I, I would say that they, I'd probably argue that that anger leads them to lack of proper judgment because I really don't understand the military strategy behind any of these First Order moves. I, I don't understand why you wouldn't send a, a hundred First Order TIE fighters out to destroy the Resistance when all they had was, you know, a few ships. Kylo Ren obviously fucked him up pretty well with like two ships himself so if he could do that with just those two why don't you just send him back out there to do it again and you know I get I get you can't cover him from that distance but I would assume that you're the first order and you have plenty and plenty of stormtroopers to take care of that or tie fighters whatever I'm, I'm sure you would have been fine but anyways Lexington Steel, <laughs> that's funny. He asked, why do people like Rogue One? People like Rogue One because of the last 30 minutes of Rogue One. Hello Greedo said it pretty good the other day, actually. Um, in his video, he talked about, he ranked his Star Wars films. And Rogue One was surprisingly close to the last of the list. But he did say, 30 minutes of boom boom isn't enough for me, or something like that. And uh, I thought that was pretty funny and pretty accurate. Rogue One is really just 30 minutes of boom boom action. And it doesn't offer anything... To the story of the Star Wars saga. I mean, honestly, if you take away Rogue One, I feel like I'm not missing anything from the Star Wars universe. Because I'm not. Rogue One was entirely built off one sentence from the opening crawl of A New Hope. And it really... It, it was made to fix a plot point of A New Hope, which is... Why is there this hole that you can shoot proton torpedoes down and it destroys the entire base? Can you not put some cardboard over that thing? Some saran wrap? I don't know. Just cover it and you'll be okay, right? That was a plot hole a lot of people had from A New Hope. Rogue One fixed that. It was making A New Hope slightly better. And it was really a callback to the original trilogy in a fan film and meant to, you know, make fans happy. 
a lot of fans like that film because there's so many cameos in it. I didn't like it because of that. I thought, you know, C-3PO and R2-D2 at the end, when they were, everyone was going to attack Scarif, I saw those two make a cameo, and I'm like, why is this in the film? That didn't need to be here. And I hate to sound like, I, you know, I'm trying to be negative Nancy towards the film. I enjoyed it when I saw it. I was actually really pleasantly surprised because my complaints for the film right now are the same complaints I had going into it, which was, all these characters are probably going to die at the end, and also, why do I care because I know how this is going to end? I mean, honestly, what are they going to do, not get the plans? I know they get the plans in A New Hope. What is the point of this film? I know how it's going to go. There's no story that I feel like is going to be offered here that I'm actually going to like. And I was right. The characters are boring. The story itself isn't the worst thing in the world, but there's some parts that really don't make sense. I mean, why why would they go to kill, what's her name, her, Jen's father, uh, Jen Urso, and uh, his name's Galen, right? I don't know. Uh, but she goes to kill, they go to kill her father, basically. She doesn't know it, but Cassian goes there to kill him. But why? Like, honestly, at that point, you already had the plans to the Death Star. You already know how to destroy this thing. Why would you not just go to the Resistance or rebel Rebellion and say, Hey, we have the plans. We have this thing right here. F forget Galen Urso. Who cares about him being alive anymore? We have the plans of the Death Star. Uh, that, that part itself didn't make much sense. And then they spent all that time on that planet, that rainy planet, for nothing. While it was cool and Galen died and you had that emotional moment with Jin. Overall, I didn't think Jin was that interesting of a character. And honestly, some of the lines from Jin or so were really cringy, honestly. I wasn't the biggest fan of Jin. The trailers were really bad. I didn't like that. Uh, the trailers that they had for her where it was like, This is a rebellion, isn't it? I rebel. And then she says, This one I can't stand either, where she's like, May the force be with us. And she's like, Why do you care about that? You didn't care about any of this shit five minutes ago. And now suddenly you're all with the force. You're all with the rebellion and everything. What a sudden change of heart. What is the blind guy in Bayes doing here? Why do they care as well? It's just, uh, yeah, there's a lot of problems with Rogue One that fans ignore because they're blinded by the fan service in the film. Now, is that a problem with the film? No. I like the fact that the film does that. Because for me, that's something that I can look at and say, fans are going to like if this film keeps coming out. Films like this, spinoffs like this. I personally won't, but it's okay. I like the fact that fans are enjoying it. This guy named Jay Blood Drunk asked, Two Star Wars only. So what the fuck is your problem after all? You know, it's a million dollar question, buddy. That is a million dollar question. Richard asked, So any idea on who's going to live or die in this episode 9? Do you think it will be two-parter like Harry Potter? Will Kylo and Rey end up being brother and sister after all? Alright, this whole two-parter thing, that rumor is not true. They're not doing a two-parter to episode 9. If they do, what the hell? One of the weird things about doing a two-parter with episode 9 is, in terms of Roman numerals, can you make a point five? Can you make a part 2? Like, are we? would it be called episode 10? Or would it be called episode 9.5? Or would it be called episode 9 part 2? That would be weird. Is it? I mean, it would be episode 9, the Roman numeral 9, and are you going to put part, the word, and then the Roman numeral 2? Or the actual, you know, number 2? So how are you how are you gonna how are you gonna work that out in terms of marketing right there? Second of all, the second question of you know who's gonna live and die, and the third question of will Kylo and Rey end up being brother and sister? I don't think they'll end up being brother and sister. I think Kylo Ren may die. I think one of these three gentlemen are gonna die: Poe Dameron, Finn, or Kylo Ren. I don't think they're gonna kill off Finn. There's a problem I have with you know in Episode Eight you're almost killing him off and he doesn't die. And then in episode 9, he really dies. For me, if there's tension of him almost dying in episode 9, it might not be there anymore. Because it's like, well, you almost killed him off in the last film and you didn't. Where's Rose at? If she just has a ship, she'll be able to save him, right? Because it's not about destroying what we hate. It's about saving what we love. One of the most interesting thoughts is, who are they going to kill at it? Are they going to kill Kylo Ren? Is the good side going to win? Is the bad side going to win? For me, the real question is going to be, who is going to win in terms of the good, the good guys or the bad guys? Because... I'm kind of confused on who's supposed to be good and bad in this film now. And I understand the First Order's evil and the Resistance is obviously good. But The Last Jedi, when it came to talking about the Jedi versus the Sith and the light side versus the dark side, it really made a gray area on what we consider as good and bad in terms of philosophical discussion about what is the good, good of the light side versus the bad of the dark side. And that offers an interesting question on what is going to happen with the Jedi in Episode Nine. Are, are the Jedi going to have basically... 
their New Testament? Are they not going to be following the Old Testament anymore and say, hey, you know, while we respect what they did back then, we're actually going to have a new version of the Jedi Order that Luke Skywalker wasn't very fond of the old Jedi Order and the ways they were doing things and the Jedi's time was over, but now we're going to make a new order, a different order, a better order, and they're not going to be called the Jedi. I'm curious if they're going to go that route, and I'm speculating that they will. I really do think in terms of future stories, I think they're going to come up with something different from the Jedi just to go their own different route and create their own universe. And that could be really good, or that could be really bad. I personally would like to keep the story on the Jedi and on the Sith, because I feel like I haven't gotten a good story from that, honestly. I mean, I got it from the original trilogy, but like George Lucas said, you didn't get to see the Sith at the height of their power. Well, you did, because they were ruling the galaxy, but I don't consider that the height of their power. You also didn't get to see the Jedi at their height of their power. You did in the prequels, but I thought that was completely missed opportunities out the wazoo. I thought that was nothing but missed opportunities... Uh, lack of good story, and I really don't think you saw the Jedi at what they really should have been, at least of what the original trilogy was alluding to. So I do think there is room to go into a different era of the Jedi and the Sith and actually really get into the good side versus the bad side like we had with the original trilogy. The prequel trilogy also was simple, good versus evil, but that was more about the good guy falling and turning into this dark side. Uh, identity and then eventually redeeming himself in the end of the original trilogy there's a lot that episode 9 has to do but won't do in a way you know we'll, it'll be very interesting to see what happens we don't know we really don't know yet so Matthew Kelly asks I had a question do you look at Hello Greedo's channel or watch one of his videos well I just talked about how I watched that uh his ranking I don't check out every video that he has I'm not the biggest fan of his channel I watched some of the stuff when he came out the, when we were younger, um, he had like a the special edition changed videos. Those are his most popular videos. I like those. I don't watch every single video of his. I don't watch his live streams. I don't watch his you know weekly uploads or anything. I just if there's a video that catches my eye or a topic that I think uh, he could offer a good opinion on, I, I might go check it out. Recently, I've definitely stopped watching as many of his videos as I used to in the past. And reason being is because I'm so involved now. A lot of these people are just saying the stuff either I've already thought about, I've already heard, or I just don't care about. So it's, Star Wars, you know, it's fun, it's a good side job, but it, I, I can't have my life be about it 24-7. So I don't check out his channel religiously. Uh, it's not that I'm a, not a fan of his channel. I, I like Hello Greedo enough. I, I think he's been a, a good influence on the Star Wars community and a good voice of reason, uh, or reasonable enough, in my opinion. Stephen Bailey asks, did Darth Vader stop Boba from shooting Chewie because C-3PO was on his back? Did he build him after all? Thoughts? Oh, he did build him after all. I don't think that is why. I really don't think the idea of Vader making C-3PO was something that was fully thought out until George wanted to make the Phantom Menace. And the only reason he put that in there was so he could actually kind of connect the two and, you know, do what they're doing with the prequels and the sequels and, you know, where they're kind of having a little bit of nostalgic to it. Like, hey, you remember this from the original trilogy? That was the whole point of having C-3PO being built by Anakin. Why did he stop Boba from shooting Chewie? Most likely just to not kill the Wookiee. You know, he was going to give them over to uh, Boba Fett anyways. And like Boba Fett says, you know, he's no good to me dead. So I really don't think there was a reason to kill uh, Chewie. It is one of those interesting questions on why didn't Darth Vader realize. And he also knew him from the prequels as well. I mean, did he just forget, I guess? I, I don't know. He probably didn't. He probably recognized him, but just didn't say anything for, you know, obvious reasons. Uh, I don't think Anakin... It, Vader is very adamant about saying, Anakin is not me anymore. I am a different person from Anakin. He's dead. So that's probably most likely why. Snowbrick Studios ask, what trilogy has better John Williams score? Prequels or the originals? Or do you not really care? Yeah, I don't really care. But if I had to pick one, though, I'd say Originals. I know a lot of people like the prequel trilogy soundtrack, and don't get me wrong, they're great. But, but there's really only one score that, you know, made Star Wars popular, and that was the original trilogy soundtrack. So definitely would say the Originals are better than the prequels, but that doesn't mean the prequels don't have some better songs. I mean, the Duel Fates is by far amazing. The Best Badness 420K asks, Do you think if someone tried to do a Star Wars fan fiction like Star Wars Theory is doing with his Vader series... Could it be as successful as his has been? I know that sounds really vague, but I just want some input. That is a good question. Star Wars Theory, the only reason his fan film was as popular as it was is because he is as popular as he is. He's the biggest Star Wars channel out there. He's got a million point five, if not more, by now. 
It's crazy. It's ridiculous how popular this guy is. And, you know, props to him. Good for him. He's put a lot of work into this. And obviously a lot of money. There's been a lot of fan films that have been really successful and that have been way more successful than the, his little Vader thing. This is going to sound kind of rude, and I don't mean it to be, but that Vader fan film was popular um, to a lot of casual Star Wars fans that aren't really actively involved with the fan film community or the fan edit community. There's a lot of different communities in the Star Wars fandom and a lot of different people who put out all these fan films and fan edits. And as someone who grew up watching fan films and fan, fan edits, I've seen them all, and I've seen far better ones and far more successful ones than what uh, Star Wars Theory put out. But like I said, his is really popular because of him. He is a popular person in the Star Wars community now, and that is why his fan film is so popular. Will there be more successful? Oh, yeah. you got to think. We're, technology is evolving into a way where these films are going to be easier to make. So now people are going to definitely start making more of these in the future. Other YouTube channels may pick up the same thing and start doing it as well. You never know. There's endless possibilities now with Star Wars. And I think Star Wars Theory's Vader fan film really showed that, that hey, now the fans can also put out their own content as well, uh, easier than we even did back in the past. Um, because you can't sit here and say the effects on that wasn't great, but doing that 10 years ago would have been a completely different story and argument. So we have a lot to look forward in terms of what the fandom can make in terms of Star Wars content. And I do think some of that's been lacking. One of the great things about that Fader fan film is it brought back something I feel like a lot of Star Wars fans have been forgetting, which is fan films. A lot of people don't care about the fan films anymore, and that's why this fan film is so popular. There's so many other fan films that are better that everyone's ignoring, and I hate that because it's like there's really a lot of content that Star Wars fans have made and worked on that is actually really good. And, and I'm not saying his fan film wasn't good. I, I did a review on it, and I said, you know, by far it's one of the best fan films we've had in a long time. But people are saying it's the best fan film ever because it's the biggest fan film for Star Wars. It's the one that everyone knows about. And I, I feel like that's disrespecting all the other people who actually put a lot more work and effort into it and a lot more money. I mean, these fan films, he, he made that within a year or two or whatever. A lot of these fan films have taken five to ten years to make in a very long time. The Darth Maul one is absolutely amazing. Uh, there's other ones with far better stories that are foreign. They're not even English-based Star Wars fan films, and they're ten times as good as that Vader fan film. You you really need to go check out some of these fan films, honestly, because there's so many, and they're all there's some really bad ones. Don't get me wrong, but the stories that they tell are really interesting. So I definitely think people need to check out some of the other fan films and not focus so much on that Vader one and think that's the only one out there now. You know, now just because it's the most popular on YouTube doesn't mean it's the only one. And I think what that fan film is going to do, and I'm excited for, is really revive the interest in the other fan films. And that's one of the greatest reasons about that fan film coming out is that it actually did kind of revive some interest in it. And so hopefully that continues to happen because I do think uh, the fan films are something we've been missing lately. And so hopefully we can work on that in the future. Uh, this next question comes from Lord Vader the Memer. He says, do you have any beef with other YouTubers? No, not like personal beef, as in like if I saw them, I would be like, oh, I don't want to talk to them or see them. I'm cool with everybody. I, I might disagree with some people. Uh, I've definitely disagreed with, uh, like Star Wars Explained. I don't agree with him on a lot of uh, his opinions on Star Wars, but that's with a lot of different YouTubers as well. It doesn't mean I, I can't be nice to each other. You know, there's a one guy, he's a Star Wars YouTuber that I like a, uh, his name is at at chat and me and him are completely different in terms of what we look at in star wars i would assume like he likes the last jedi i don't like the last jedi and everything so we definitely have different opinions on star wars but we're still cool and we still chat often so i don't really have beef with anybody i just disagree with certain people so definitely no beef with anyone this next question comes from malcolm he says what kind of lightsaber would you like to see ray use in episode nine i really think they should give her a saber staff that's something that I think would be really cool and kind of like a callback to the prequels in a way with Darth Maul's lightsaber, but also showing, hey, she's unique now. She's actually having her own lightsaber. It'd be cool if it was like a blue saber staff, you know, if she just sticks with the blue color. Or if it was green, I feel like green also would go well with her as well, especially the outfit she had in episode 7. That little lighter tone to it would go really well with a green saber staff. The yellow one is meant for the Sentinels. And they can kind of do everything, I believe. And that does kind of match up with Rey. I mean, she is kind of someone who isn't... She's overly powerful in everything, in every which way. So I really don't know which which one I would give her. She seems to be a Jedi Consular in terms of being able to lift all those rocks at the end of The Last Jedi like it wasn't shit. So in that aspect, I guess she's a green lightsaber user. So maybe we'll see her with the green saber staff. I think that's the best route to go.
honest to God. If you give her just a casual old lightsaber, or let's say she doesn't even have one. What if they do that? What if they change it up so much that, they, that she doesn't have a lightsaber in episode 9? Do you think that'd be crazy? I mean, that's don't say it's not bold. And don't say it doesn't subvert your expectations. But the question would be, would it work? I mean, they could make that work. Her not having a lightsaber and her truly sticking to the Jedi code of being like, hey, I'm defending myself, but I'm not going to use this weapon or anything like that. That would be very interesting. Uh, will it happen? I don't think so. There's so much money that goes into the merchandising money they're going to make alone from from Ray's lightsaber is going to be ridiculous. So there's no point of not making one. But I do think that would be interesting of a thought of what if she didn't have one. This next question comes from C.R. Allen 27. He says, would you like if Ezra turned to the dark side at the end of season two? And he's, of course, talking about Star Wars Rebels. I really think that was a missed opportunity with Star Wars Rebels. It was an interesting arc of Ezra wanting to turn to the dark side because he wants to defeat the Sith and save his family. And his family is the Ghost Squadron. And Rebels wasn't the greatest show in the world. A lot of filler episodes that I didn't like. But that arc itself was very interesting. And him teaming up with Maul, that dynamic, that duo, and the chemistry they had was something that intrigued me and made me go, I want to see more of these two working together. And I want to see Ezra actually turn to the dark side and yes, kind of get redeemed back towards the end or something like that. But that would have been so much more interesting, in my opinion, of a story for Ezra of him being tempted towards the dark side and then kind of coming back. And he did come back, so I guess it is a good story in general, but he really didn't step over to the dark side at all. He just kind of had a little bit of a, a look to him, and he was interested for maybe about a, a month or two, and that was about it. And so that was kind of disappointing. I think it would be very interesting if Ezra and Sabine and Ahsoka kind of reunite or whatever, and he's like a dark villain now. He, he turned to the dark side or something. Let's say he actually killed the Thrawn out of some big battle they were having on that planet that they're that they're in or whatever that whatever happened to them we don't know that would be very interesting in my opinion and a good story that could be told right there but who knows only Dave Filoni knows what's going to happen with those characters this next question comes from Emmett Burke I believe is how you say his last name he says love your vids are you going to Star Wars Celebration love to get a pic with you yes I am going to Star Wars Celebration I am uh, recording it and vlogging it. I'm going to try to put as much video out as I can. I'm going to try to interview some people. Uh, any of the fans that are going there, I would love to interview uh, some of the people and for future documentaries that I'm making and the one that's coming out on May 19th. I know I've talked about this before, I believe. But yeah, I would love to meet you, Emmett, and uh, get a good picture with you and everything and say hi. I'd love to meet some fans and everything. I'm glad you like the channel, and I can't wait to meet you, my friend. Next question comes from... Hey, Cheese, how can The Last Jedi be fixed when moving on with the franchise? Well, you can't fix something that's already been done. You know, it's you can't go back and change The Last Jedi. Are, are they going to do something like they did with the special editions of the original trilogy? No, because I think that they do that with The Last Jedi or The Force Awakens or the sequel trilogy in general in a way that would be admitting fault in some way on what happened. And I don't think that's something they'd want to do. And also, when it came to doing the special editions for the original trilogy, and even doing some changes with the prequel trilogy and some of the DVD releases they had, they changed up Yoda and everything, that was all because of George Lucas. George Lucas was in control of Star Wars. He was the creator and the owner of Star Wars. Now that you have Disney owning it, it's kind of like, all right, well, who has the creative authority to go in and change these films and fix them in any way? You look at Kathleen Kennedy. She's the president of Lucasfilm, but she didn't direct The Last Jedi. She didn't direct The Force Awakens. So would she really want to go in there and edit it and work on it at all? No, she would have little interest in doing that. She'd want J.J. Abrams or Ryan Johnson to go in and fix it. But then the question is, would they even want to come back and do it? So you can't fix it in that aspect of it. You can't fix the film in terms of making special editions, coming out with something on DVD, again, it's set in stone. It belongs to the ages now. It's set in history for Star Wars. Let's say we go from the perspective of The Last Jedi. I think the best way the franchise can move on from that film is simply go, it happened, let's get over it. We don't really want to... If, if Disney wants to keep making these films, I think the best thing to do is just kind of avoid that film, don't talk about it and just get away from the Skywalker saga like they're doing and go to a different part of the galaxy and say, hey, I understand you don't like The Last Jedi, but we're not dealing with that story anymore. That story's done, and what happened happened. It is what it is. And that sucks to say because, like I said, I don't like the film, but there's nothing we can do anymore. It's one of those things where you just kind of have to, in a way, get over it. You know, For me, it's like, well, I can't change up Luke Skywalker's character arc anymore in The Last Jedi. 
I'll have to see what happens to him in episode nine. But right now, there's nothing I can do. So there's no point in trying to say, "Hey, are we gonna fix anything with the Last Jedi?" When you can't fix anything. C.R. Allen also asks another question. He says, "Are you going to the Rogue Squad podcast party after Star Wars CE?" Oh, I think he's talking about Celebration. Rogue Squad podcast party. Uh, I, I mean. Sure, if I can make time for it, if I know where it's at or anything, uh, definitely send me some more information uh, through my Instagram or something, and I'll see if I can make it and definitely go to that. I mean, if it's a party, I'll, I'll be there if it's a party, man. If it's if it's a good party, I'll be there for any time. Well, that is it for today's questions, guys. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. I know it was a lengthy Let's Talk podcast, but I had a great time making it. I want to say thank you all for 25,000 subscribers. We hit 26,000, I believe, a day or two ago. So we're growing really well, but we just got to keep putting out videos, and uh, I, I got to keep going with it. But I've been working hard on my documentaries. I am having one coming out on May 19th of this year. I'm working on it right now. It's, it's taking me a while, but there's a lot of work going into it, and I'm hoping to get it out on time, on schedule. So tell me your thoughts below. What do you guys think about the conversations we had today? Give me your feedback on anything and everything. Hope you guys enjoyed this talk. Thank you all for 25,000 subscribers. I'm Star Wars Only. I will see you all next time. And may the Force be with you. Always.